Tekoäly puhuttaa edelleen todella paljon ja viime aikoina tekoälyn maailmaan on tullut myös isoja muutoksia. Esimerkiksi DeepSeek tuli hiljattain markkinoille ja vähän niinku muutti koko tilanteen. Ja hiljattain mä tein myös videon tekoälyn tulevaisuudesta, kaikista niistä mahdollisuuksista mitä sillä on. Ja tänään jatketaan tätä aihetta ja päästään itse asiassa haastattelemaan EUn asiantuntijaa AI Actista, joka on tekoälylaki, tekoälyä säätelevä laki. Eli todella mielenkiintoinen video tiedossa tänään, mutta ihan ekana. Tämä video on tehty yhteistyössä Sonin kanssa. Mä sain Sonilta uuden kameran, jolla mä itse asiassa kuvaan tälläkin hetkellä. Ja ennen kuin mennään tuohon haastatteluun, niin unboxataan tämä kamera ja katsotaan vähän, että minkälainen kamera on kyseessä. Yes, eli tosiaan Sony lähetti mulle tämän Sony ZVE 10 Mark 2, joka on erityisesti vlogaamiseen ja just tämmöiseen tubettamiseen soveltuva kamera. Ja itsekin on käyttänyt niin kuin Sonin kameroita pääsääntöisesti jo niin kuin monta vuotta niin kuin pääkamerana tässä tubettamisessa ja muussa sometekemisessä. Ja tämä on niin hyvä upgrade itsellekin tässä tekemisessä, joten iso kiitos Sonille, että laittoivat yhteistyönä tämän kameran tulemaan. Ja tänään voitaisiin vähän unboxata ja katsoa, että mitä täällä laatikossa oikein tulee mukana. Ja se mitä mä tarkoitan sillä, että tämä on niin vlogaamiseen erityisesti soveltuva kamera, on että Sonin mukaan esimerkiksi tämä kameran sisäinen mikrofoni on huomattavasti parempi kuin normaaleissa peilittömissä järkkäreissä, joten siitä on tietenkin hyötyä vlogaamisessa ja kaikessa videotekemisessä, mutta tämä on myös erityisesti niin kuin hybridikamera, eli soveltuu sekä videoon että valokuviin. Ja toki tästä tietenkin löytyy ihan 3,5 millin kuuleken liitäntä ihan ulkoisiakin mikrofoneja varten, mutta varsinkin tämmöiselle aloittavalle tekijälle tämä olisi tosi hyvä ratkaisu siinä mielessä, että tuo sisäinenkin mikki on niin hyvä ja laadukas. Ja tietysti sometekemistä varten esimerkiksi tuo pysty, Moodi on tosi tärkeä nykyään ja se tässä on tosi hyvä ja laadukas. Ja modernit liitännät muutenkin, eli USB-C-liitin, mitä esimerkiksi tuossa mun vanhassa Sonin kamerassa ei ole, joten se tulee olla itsellekin tosi tärkeä upgrade lataamisen kannalta. Ja täältä paljastuu sitten itse kameran runko, eli täältä näyttää se tässä tulee tämmönen kitti linssi mukana. Eli tässä olisi kääntyvä näyttö, joka on myös itselle iso upgrade, koska mun vanhassa kamerassa ei ollut tätä, eli voi niinku kääntää itteensä päin ton näytön ja katsoa sitten, että miltä näyttää, kun kuvaa videoita esimerkiksi. Tosi kätevä. Ja tosi hyvä tämä runko siinäkin mielessä, että tämä on niin tosi kompakti just tämmöiseen vlogaamiseen ja muuhun, että kun meet tuolla ulkona, niin ei tarvitse olla mitään massiivista runkoa mukana, mutta silti saat niin tosi laadukasta kuvaa. Ja yksi tosi iso niin upgrade itselle tulee olemaan myös 4K 60 framea, mitä tämä kamera pystyy kuvaan, mitä mun vanha kamera ei todellakaan pystynyt kuvaa. Katsotaan vielä, mitä muuta täällä laatikossa tuli. No, tietysti kamera hihna. Mikille tietysti toi suojauskuva vaikka ulkona tuulisella säällä. Ja tietysti akku, että pääsee liikkeelle kameran kanssa. Mutta hei, tämmönen tuli postissa Sonilta. Iso kiitos vielä Sonille tästä. Ja myös jonkin ajan päästä tulevassa videossa tuun kertoa vähän, että mitä on tykännyt tästä kamerasta, lempiominaisuuksia ja mielipiteitä näin edespäin. Joten palataan silloin tähän asiaan, mutta nyt mennään suoraan videoon haastatteleen EU-asiantuntijaa. Hi, thanks for taking the time. If you would introduce yourself to my viewers. Yeah, my name is Martin Urbich. Uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, I work in the European Commission in the newly created AI office, uh, which is really a, a new uh, form of uh, our AI policy department. I've been working in AI policy for the last seven years, and uh, I've been for a long time a lone economist among a group of lawyers. AI is a big topic of conversation. What is the AI Act and what does it aim to do? Well, the AI Act is a European regulation, so it's been adopted by the European Union. And the purpose of the AI Act is to make sure that AI is safe and respects our fundamental rights. Uh, AI is a technology which can be applied in many areas. Uh, the vast majority of AI applications are perfectly um, not only harmless, but actually very useful. So we are very positive about AI, but there's some things with AI which you can do Uh, which uh, previously were not possible and where you might want to have some limits. For example, you know, thanks to AI, you can uh, have much uh, better face recognition and you can have much better uh, surveillance. You know, you can put cameras everywhere and then try to find out people out of a big crowd. Um, so there have to be some limits on, on what, for example, public authorities are allowed to do with that, because otherwise you could, for example, create a perfect surveillance state. And that's really what the AI Act does. It, uh, it, it, uh, it identifies a couple of a very small number of AI use cases which are totally forbidden. Uh, it then identifies another group which, is, which are uh, perfectly acceptable and, and legitimate use cases, but where you have to be very careful because if they go, things go wrong, then they can have a very negative impact. 
Uh, it also induces a bit of transparency uh, for things like deep fakes uh, and, and the AI generated text. So if you are uh, talking uh, <laughs> to a chatbot, for example, you, are, uh, you will be told that you are talking to an AI system, not to a human, unless it's obvious. These AI services and products are constantly being launched. What about consumers? How will the AI act show itself in the everyday life of consumers using these services and products, if at all? Well, hopefully not at all. I mean, that, that's really the purpose. It's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's based on the idea of product safety. It's a bit like, um, you know, if you have a car and it gets sold to you, uh, before that it needs to be a type approval. So the uh, technology authorities have to make sure that it's safe. But you never know about that. You just buy a car. And for the AI system, it's going to be the same thing. You will never know about whatever the AI system has been, you know, how it, how it has been checked and what kind of criteria it had to fulfill. You just will use it and know it's safe. There are a few exceptions. I mean, the transparency obligations, uh, you will actually notice them. So, uh, for example, if you have a deep fake, uh, it has to be identified. There will be a, few, a couple of, you know, some letters saying this is AI generated. Or as I mentioned, uh, if you are talking to a chatbot, uh, you you have to be notified. So at the beginning, it will say you are now talking to an AI system. A lot of people are worried about AI also and the rapid uh, evolving state of AI. Does the AI Act protect consumers in the rapid evolving state of AI and the worrying scenarios it might pose in the future? Well, we have two parts in the AI Act, really. One is part um, where we um, make sure that concrete applications are are not negative, so they're either prohibited or, uh, well, a few of them are prohibited, a few of them are regulated, most of the others are considered innocent. But then we also have a part uh, about the general purpose AI model. So that's the big ones that you hear about, you know, like uh, starting with, uh, well, DALL-E and uh, ChatGPT and now Meta and uh, you know, Meta's uh, Yama and the DeepSeek from China, which came out uh, a couple of days ago. So that's really talking about the, the, uh, the very big models. And of course, that's the ones uh, if you know, whenever you talk about science fiction movies and about you know, kind of the end of the world scenarios, we're talking about very large models. Mm -hmm. And for that, uh, for those very large models, we have a specific regulation which is done directly by the European AI Office. Uh, and where really the point is, uh, in addition to transparency requirements and you know, making sure that they uh, identify copyrighted uh, on the, the copyright uh, of the of the data they use is respected, etc., etc. Uh, the key point really is that they have to do red teaming. They have to get a bunch of people trying to uh, to kidnap the system. You know, make it do things it's not supposed to. Make it break down, make it uh, turn evil. Uh, you know, and we have to supervise that they actually do that. And then obviously, if they manage, I mean, if that team actually manages to to, to turn the system against uh, its original purpose, then of course you have to go back to the drawing board and get a new version where hopefully that doesn't work anymore, you know, and that goes on and on and on until eventually you have a system where that doesn't happen. And on that note, you know, because the AI is evolving so fast, does the EU and the AI Act, are they ready to conform to the evolving state of AI, even in the case of, you know, we talk about the science fiction <laughs> scenarios, AGI or even ASI, if those become a reality? Can the AI Act evolve? I, I think so. Yes. I mean, I, I mean, the one thing which you have to realize is that any kind of regulation will always be late. You know, that's totally inevitable because unless you have a technology on the market, there's no need for regulation. So you, you know, once you have the technology, you start about, you start thinking about whether you need to regulate or not. So by definition, you're always late. You know, you, the situation is not that regulation will ever be on time. However, um, I think we, we can actually adapt fairly rapidly to, to, the, uh, to the evolving situation. Uh, it certainly did take a lot of time to get the AI Act started, but that's because there was nothing there to build on. First re AI regulation in the world, nobody ever had thought about regulating AI before. Uh, and that's why it took a couple of years. And certainly there's, uh, you know, there's a big gap between uh, the AI <coughs> which existed when we proposed the legislation in 2020, 21, Mm -hmm. uh, and the AI which exists today, you know, that has a, a very, very different scales, among other things. But now that we have a system, it's much easier. We have a, a couple of, uh, of, of, of organizations which can take care of that. We have an AI board, which is really where European regulators from all the member states come together and, and discuss things. So um, the circulation, uh, sorry, the information will circulate much quicker about something which is happening in any country than can immediately uh, be communicated uh, throughout. And then we've got now a European AI office where we actually have people doing full-time supervision of these big AI models. So they actually can be pretty much informed in real time about what's happening there. So, um, you know, it's not going to be perfect. Um, there will still be things coming on the market which nobody had foreseen and uh, which therefore have not been vetted yet. But uh, I think we're, we're, we're on, on, a, on a pretty good path.
a common question in my circles, in the tech circles, is how does the EU, EU ensure that the AI Act doesn't slow down innovation? So how do you answer that? Yeah, I mean, that, that of course was a big question uh, from the very beginning. I mean, that was something which we took very seriously. Um, well, I think the main the main way of doing that is by focusing on a just very small number of cases. Um, you know, as I mentioned, the list of the forbidden and the high risk cases are very small. I mean, the, high, the, the forbidden cases is something like eight or nine use cases. Uh, and the high risk cases is, um, you know, it's eight groups. If you take them all together, maybe 25. So uh, all together, you've got like 35 cases which are subject to any regulation. And then you've got the transparency. But the transparency regulation, that's really nothing. I mean, you just have to put in a couple of words. So in terms of you know, bureaucratic overhead or red tape, that's nothing there. But for the others where there's actually something something significant, uh, it's, you know, 35 AI applications out of what, 10,000, 100,000 million applications which are going to come over the year. So it's an extremely small number. Uh, and I think that's that's the first very important part. And the second part is that even for those where uh, there are risks, the obligations are really very, very, very kind of um, very much limited to state of the art. You know, it's making sure that things which any reasonable operator would do anyway are not just done by any advanced uh, market leader, by by everybody. You know, things like making sure that you have uh, that your AI system is robust, resistant to cyber secure, uh, security threats, and and accurate. That it has representative data. You know, this, these are not things that that normal developers would not do, but some people might not do it, and therefore, and then they might create some serious damage. So it's important that they actually are mandatory. But for a large majority, and I would say a very the vast majority of, of companies, that's what they would do anyway because it just uh, makes a lot of sense for their business. Well, I thank you a lot for your time, and thanks for the interview. Thank you so much. Jes, eli semmoinen video tänään. Kiitos paljon katsomisesta. Jos tämä herätti jotain ajatuksia, pistäkää ihmeessä kommenttia. Me nähdään taas erittäin pian seuraavien videoiden parissa. Kiitos katsomisesta. Se on moro.